thank you for the message. Uh, I've been uh, I've been thinking about something someone had shared something a couple months ago, and uh, there was a brother that had shared. Maybe it was a little bit longer than that, but during the sharing time that we have, they shared something very, very brief. It was like one or two sentences or maybe just one very long sentence. And I came up to the brother afterwards and just said, thank you for sharing that because I remembered that. And um, I was thinking just uh, as I'm going to share today, just with one verse, but the impact that um, that one verse can have or just a short message that the Lord can give us. Um, and what I want to talk about this morning was just one of the memory verses that uh, I believe it was the primary class in Psalms 34, uh, when we read that verse about the um, about them being radiant and not being ashamed, and and I looked it up in the Living Bible, and I I liked the way that the Living Bible had said it. Um, I'll just read it. It said, "Others too were radiant at what He did for them. Theirs was no downcast look of rejection." Um, a little bit different than uh, not being ashamed, but I was thinking even just. Just one moment ago, um, if you were to say who who had the radiant faces here, um, sitting here, I'd say it was the children because we see the children, uh, they get all excited about going to Sunday school and their faces are radiant. And um, I've even seen my own children trip out of the aisle trying to get to Sunday school because they're so excited about it. And there's a look on their on their faces, and maybe it's to be with their friends because they're they're young, but I think that they want to learn about. God's word as well. Um, but there's an excitement there. And, uh, you know, the Bible talks about having that fragrance of Christ. And I was thinking about um, um, the second part, there there was no downcast look of rejection. And um, I think when you look at that picture that was um, given for that verse, if you're, if you're on that Viber, that picture of um, like the being sort of rejected or ashamed and then the kid is looking like in, in awe and then he's uh in love at the end there uh his his he realizes he's loved um i was thinking about that with you, you know if um uh, i look back at my life and i remember when i had first met my wife Kristen. i remember uh meeting people after i had met her <laughs> they said there was like this radiant look about my face. And they said, what's different about you? And I said, oh, I got to tell you about this girl I met. I really have to tell you about her. Um, and it's sort of like that, I think, with uh, with Christ, that there there should be a radiancy that we have. There should be a fragrance. Um, and we hear, you know, we just heard about Halloween, just as an example. And when people in the workplace, um, when they might say, oh, wait, that's weird. Why don't? You know, uh, HR has uh, uh, something planned for Halloween, and the company's planned something. Why? Why aren't you participating? It's not to make the you know condemn anyone, as we heard, but we can use these examples. Um, we could use this, and people see that we have a radiancy about us. That we are different. Um, we're not partaking in in the things of the world. Um, and that second part, there was no downcast look of rejection. It's not. Um, you know, we when we think of being, um, when I think of the life of Christ, I think of um, he was a man of sorrows, it says in Isaiah, but but he also had a joy set before him. It, it wasn't this um, rejected look. You know, I think of, I guess, another example with the kids when you're playing uh, uh, soccer or dodgeball or something and you're picking teams, and you kind of feel bad that you're the last person picked. It's not a very good good feeling for a kid sometimes. And there's almost like a rejected look like, boy, nobody wanted me. Um, and, and it's not that look of rejection when we have Christ in our lives, there's a radiancy, um, similar to like, again, I guess picturing when I, when I got married, the day I got married and you know, they, they say the guy kind of has like a, a big dopey grin on his face because he's so, <laughs> he's just like, so amazed, you know, his, his bride is coming and he's going to get married. Um, but yeah, that the, this verse really spoke to me, and it's just a uh, thing, you know, something that we can do as we encourage each other daily. Um, be encouraged to have that radiant look, uh, like we've um, met with Christ. That the Lord is speaking to us. Uh, that there is no 
downcast look um, in, in, our, in our faces. Amen. Uh, the Lord's been speaking to me through the life of, um, of Jeremiah. And we, we've, I think it's, a, it's been about a few weeks, three or four weeks since we went through, in the Bible, if you're following the Bible reading, the book of Jeremiah, I think we completed it a few weeks ago. And a few things the Lord has been teaching me through his life and ministry. Um, and if you know, Jeremiah was not one of the, um, he, was, he was very despised. Um, he was persecuted when, whenever he prophesied, and his message eventually was rejected by Judah, and then um, what he warned against happened, and his heart was that they would repent and turn to God, and that uh, they wouldn't go into exile, but it happened eventually. They never listened to him. Um, one of those situations was in Jeremiah 36, um, when the Lord, actually I'll read the first few verses of Jeremiah 36. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And this was the Lord saying, there's one more chance, Jeremiah. This, you can go to this king, to these people, and say, judgment is coming. It's very close. The Babylonians are here. But if they turn, so that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I might forgive their iniquity and their sin, there's still hope. There is a last chance. Go ahead and, and, and tell this king. And it's a tragic chapter, actually. If you read, um, let me read from verse... 22 onwards. So the scroll in which Jeremiah recorded everything was read before the king. In verse 22, in, it was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in his winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him. As Jehudi read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot, until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. And as I was reading that, that's such a horrifying chapter. Judgment was so close, and the Lord said, Jeremiah, there's one more chance. Why don't you write it down and let it be read before the king? And that's how they decided to treat God's word. And then a couple chapters later, and this time judgment's at the very doorstep, Jeremiah 38 and this time it was uh, to Zedekiah. In verse 2, thus says the Lord, who's, um, he who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Again, this is a word that Jeremiah brought to Zedekiah. And this time they decided to throw him in the cistern. Um, and verse 6, the last part, and there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank in the mud. And this is how they treated Jeremiah, who was before the Lord, who brought the word faithfully to the people, who brought that last chance of repentance to the people. They rejected it, treated him shamefully, and this time threw him in the well. And finally, judgment came. Chapter 39, the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and then God spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and, and asked him to Pardon Jeremiah and let him live because he wasn't guilty of the sin that Judah was. And Jeremiah 40 and verse 2, this is what was offered to Jeremiah. The captain of the guard, guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God pronounced this disaster against this place. The Lord has brought it about and has, and has done as he said, because you have sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice. This thing has come upon you. Speaking of Judah. And verse 4 now behold, I will release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you, come with me to Babylon, come. And I will look after you well, but if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. In verse 5, if you remain, then return to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people, or go wherever you think is right for you to go. It was like a retirement plan. Jeremiah, you, you, you served the Lord honestly. You brought the word to them. They rejected you. They despised you. They persecuted you. But you're not guilty of their sin. So 
they got what they deserved. And here's your retirement plan. Actually, come over to Babylon and you can live a happy life the rest of your life because your ministry is done. Or you can live here and I will protect you. What do you choose? And Jeremiah decided to stay back if you read the rest of that chapter. He didn't go to Babylon. He didn't want the riches of this world. He didn't want to live luxuriously. He stayed back and instead he wept. He wept for God's people. He mourned. Um, the book of Lamentations records that. All the first four chapters, Jeremiah weeping for God's people. This very people that treated him the way that they did, that despised his message, that persecuted him. And when he had the chance to live his life and say, okay, I did my work, my responsibility is done, now it's time for me. And this was permitted by God. Jeremiah said, no, I'll stay back and I'll weep and mourn for the people. And he did that because he knew Lamentations 3 and verse 31. He knew this about God. He said, for the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he caused grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. And Jeremiah knew this about God. He knew that this is not going to be forever. And so he decided, so I'll stay back and I'll weep for my people until the Lord answers. And then not just weep, but he said in Lamentation chapter 5, Remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to the strangers, our homes to foreigners. And verse 20, 20, um, 20 of chapter 5. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days of old, unless you have utterly rejected us. And I was so encouraged by that. What a heart Jeremiah had. That even though his message was despised and he was treated so shamefully by God's people, he, he, he remained and he wept for them and he bore their burden still till the end. And even when they went away to Babylon, he stayed back and he prayed and, and he prayed for restoration. He prayed for revival. And that's how Jesus was too. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And I was thinking about how, you know, whenever a song is written about Old Testament saints, they write about Elijah and Moses and Daniel you never, I've never ever heard a song about Jeremiah because there's nothing really to write about. He was the weeping prophet. And, and that's how Jesus was too. He was called the man of sorrows. We just heard from Santosh in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was so sorrowful. And Jesus was in a similar place too in the Garden of Gethsemane. If, if somebody had gone and asked him, uh, we've heard how Jesus had the choice to walk away. Someone went and told him, why for this people? Why for, for Alan? Look how he's lived his life. Why do you have to bear this burden for him? You can walk away. The Father is completely pleased with you. You've lived the perfect life. Why should your life end this way, bearing this great sorrow, being separated from your Father and having to bear that cross? And only few will know that, you rise, that you've risen from the dead. And so your life on earth will end in shame in most people's eyes. Why do you want to do this? But Jesus still decided to go ahead and bear my burdens and through this, I believe the Lord is asking me through these two examples to, to be like that, to bear the burdens of people around me, people in the church, people in the family of God. If there's anything in my life that is going well, for example, if my kids are healthy, to not be happy that, thank you, Lord, that my kids are healthy, but to look around and see, Lord, there are other children that are not healthy, that are going through sicknesses. I want to bear those burdens, Lord. During the week, I want to pray for them. I want to weep for them. Or if I find out that, I don't know, that somebody is in sin, maybe a teenager is, um, there's something worldly about them that I noticed, or I don't know, they're dressing up for Halloween or something. Instead of saying, instead of condemning them and saying, what are they doing? Their parents are listening to the same messages I'm listening to. Instead of that, to have the heart of Jeremiah, the heart of Jesus, and to go and weep for them, to pray for them, to ask for restoration. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, um, Bear one another's burdens. Let me quickly turn. Yeah, bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. To be like Jesus, who all through his life on earth, the sorrows that Jesus went through were not because of his own sake. It was not his sin that was separating him from the Father. It was my sin. And the cross that he bore was not his cross. It was mine. 
And the law of Christ, he asked me to fulfill and follow him the same way that he lived, bear one another's burdens. And I want to do that. I want to bear the burdens of his people, to look around, to see what what is burdening other people, to see what's causing others to grieve, and to not just be happy with my little circle and look around and say, everything's looking good for me, my job's going well, um, everybody's healthy, um, and I'm taking care of my responsibility, but to be like Jeremiah and to be like my Savior Jesus, to bear one another's burdens, to be sorrowful for the sake of another brother or sister in the church. Amen. Mm-hmm.